during that sit, I don't know how how sort of uh, helpful it was and whether you got a sense of this, but so just one sec. There. Um, I wanted to try to convey just a little bit of the flavor of sitting with a koan, which is that they are sometimes actually questions like, what is this? Who am I? What is your original face from before even your parents were born? What is the sound of one hand? These are some of the better known koans. Sometimes they're questions, yes, and sometimes they're statements. Not knowing is most intimate. Not knowing is most intimate. That's one. Or um, put out the fire a thousand miles away. Stop the sound of the distant bell. Dwelling nowhere, mind comes forth. Okay, these are all examples of koans. But even when they're a statement, they sort of contain questions. <laughs> even if it's just like, what the hell is this? You know, um, usually there's something in a in a koan that sort of doesn't make sense. There, that is kind of like like what's the sound of one hand? I, I you know really what well, what are we even supposed to do with that? Well, the one thing that we don't need to do is try to figure it out. So this is my first general point I want to make about koans is that actually they are invitations to mystery. They are invitations not to more knowing. They're not invitations to kind of colonizing more territory with our minds. You know, there's a certain amount I understand and now I'm going to understand something more through this koan. Actually, no, that's not what they are. They're not an invitation to broaden what we know. Sort of like, here's the land I know, and I'm, I'm going to know a bit more on the sort of similar kind of land, that sort of thing. No, they're not for that. They have a very particular... And I would say precious purpose. Um, so I'm just going to lay this out first, and then I'm going to back up and explain a little bit more, sort of like how they came to be, and you know, so they're not quite sounding quite so, so, so weird and mysterious, almost mystical or something. No, they their 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 purpose is actually not so much to, you know let us know more on the same level that we normally know things, but actually to release knowing. I know this, this sounds a bit weird, I know, but hopefully I can bring it around by the end of the talk. To release knowing and open up into being in other ways. It is, we know we're kind of getting somewhere with a koan, so to speak, when we don't know what kind of what's going on, or when we realize that we've released the need to know. We've relinquished, renounced the need to understand. We're sort of falling, being absorbed by some 
other sense of being, some other way of being, some other mode of experiencing. That's what koans can sort of invite us toward and indeed into, into not kind of more knowing of the kind that we know, <laughs> but into not knowing and a new kind of experiencing. Okay, that's a very sort of initial kind of attempt to sort of define a purpose. I want to come back to it and say a little bit more about it. But now let me just swing, pivot, whatever, to slightly different approach. I'm going to give you an example of rather a well-known koan. I mean, it's well-known <laughs> in the Zen world. You know? I mean, I say something like the sound of one hand is actually quite well-known, right? I mean, it's, it's not only in Zen circles that people have heard of that. J.D. Salinger used that as the epigraph to his great little book, Nine Stories, back in whatever that was, the late 40s, early 50s. Um, so, you know, he, he put the, the full koan actually of that is, you know, the sound of two hands clapping. So here we are, the kind of knowing that we know. Yep, I know the sound of two hands clapping. But what is the sound of one hand? That's the original coin. What's the sound of this? That's like, well, why are you even asking me that? What am I, what am I supposed to do with that? It's crazy. Yeah, because it's a different, it's not really even a different kind of knowing. It's a release of knowing to experiencing this in a really different way. What way? Well, I want to get to that. Okay. And maybe it's not only one way, by the way. <laughs> it's, this is, uh, now, okay, here's the, this is the example, actually, I want to, I want to work with tonight. So, wait, play with, maybe. Or, you know, invite us to sample, enjoy, taste tonight. Um, there's a great um, master from the annals of Zen who lived from 778 to 897 called Joshu or Zhao Zhou. The Chinese name, Zhao Zhou, the sort of J Japanese pronunciation of his name, Joshu, is how it's come to many of us in the West is sort of via Japan. By the way, Zen, you know, really got going in China, actually, as Chan Buddhism. It's a form of Buddhism that's, uh, well, it's, of course, you know, deeply Buddhist. <laughs> it is a form of Buddhism, but it's also kind of a little different from, say, early traditional Theravada, you know, Indian Buddhism, because it came to China as Indian Buddhism of its time, which was around the year zero, roughly around then, started coming to China. And in China, it sort of morphed and became a bit more Chinese, you know, and, and it, that mostly meant adopting or kind of aligning with or kind of be, sort of yeah not not exactly adopting but absorbing some Taoism. now there was a happy meeting between buddhism and Taoism in in certain ways one of them being that you know Buddhism has this um, uh, this insight deep in the, its 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 roots, you know, deep in its tradition, 
uh, of of coming to experience what is meant by no self and related to that coming to experience what is meant by things being shunya or empty and this these two things really things are empty self is empty no self no self no things or empty self empty things these two kind of elements or insights that are in core teachings of buddhism um they found a kind of meeting place meeting point in taoism that had this sense that somehow just underneath all appearings all appearing things all things that appear this whole world of appearances that we we live in and we're part of kind of just under it or kind of just behind it or kind of right in it there's sort of another condition which they called wu which can be translated as absence and sometimes they talked about all things come forth sort of present themselves blaze forth in one rendition from this absence so and all things are part of this absence so all things meet in this absence in a comparable way to the way that all things are empty in buddhist experience so all things meet in emptiness so emptiness is also oneness all in emptiness all things are one there's no separation among things okay so maybe this is all too much too fast but i'm trying to sort of uh, give some of the sort of backdrop of how chan emerged and what it wanted to really share so it's a sort of a two rivers two deep rivers of practice finding that they can flow together in a marvelous way and they each have uh things to bring to the to the party <laughs> and and can make practice rich and deep for human beings you know and 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 the and so chan was this sort of two rivers flowing and mixing beautifully you know and, and buddhism and taoism so here we are now what what then so in this sort of rather beautiful amazing period of chinese history called the tang dynasty which was from uh, uh well i think they date it usually as like 618 to 908 okay so roughly 600 700 800 those three centuries roughly during that period chan really flourished meaning lots of people found themselves sort of awakening to the realities that chan was trying to help them awaken to <laughs> um and among all these awakened practitioners you know some became teachers masters you know and some of those masters said things and did things that were often kind of weird but there was somehow an expression of their awakened way of seeing things and some of the things they said and did got recorded and of those recorded sayings and doings some became koans okay so now here's an example this master joshu yeah by the way anybody who did the math he did live for 119 years um in fact they they say he was 120 when he died because they count from what we call year 0 in china as year 1 so 120 years when he died and this is not legend the 
the Chinese sort of bureaucrats and administration generally kept good records. So there's no doubt about it. And quite a lot of masters in this period, that's to say Zen Chan practitioners, uh, did lead, lead quite long lives, by no means all, but, but some, some number did. And there's a speculation that, you know, well, they were actually leading extremely healthy lives. They lived in valleys up in the mountains, had simple diets, had relatively quiet lives, and so on. So it's plausible. Um, anyway, Joshu, apparently 120 when he died, he uh, was teaching for the last 40 years of his life and running a little monastery, apparently rather sort of decrepit, run-down, small monastery. And um, and he here's a, here's a kind from, from his teaching days. It goes like this. Um, a monk came to Joshu and said, I have just joined the monastery. Please, master, give me some instruction. You know, I've, I've just come, I've entered, I've, it's quite a big step. I've left home. I've come here all this way to practice with you. I've sort of uh, renounced my worldly life, at least for some period of time. And I, I sort of put myself in your hands. Help me, guide me. How shall I practice? Joshua responds, have you eaten your rice gruel yet? Okay. The monk says, please help me, guide me. Joshua says, have you eaten your rice gruel yet? The monk says, yes, I have. Joshua says, then wash your bowls. Then wash your bowls. And that's the end of the koan. There's just this little dialogue. Sort of, please guide me, okay? Have you eaten your porridge? Have you eaten your oatmeal? They had rice gruel. Have you eaten your cereal? Have you eaten your, um, you know, your cinnamon toast crunches? <laughs> have you eaten your cornflakes? Yes, I have. Then wash your bowls. Bowls, plural, actually, because they usually had, I think, typically three bowls that were part of the monk's paraphernalia. One would be a sort of little one, medium one, and a larger one. I don't think even the large one was very large. The larger was very large, actually. And they might get sort of rice in one, and then maybe some little add-on, you know, a bit of seaweed or a little pickled plum or something that could be added to the rice gruel. Rice gruel, uh, by the way, is still very common in Japan and I assume in China. Um, and commonly, when I've done retreats in Japan, quite, well, most days, uh, breakfast is, is rice gruel, which means that basically it's kind of watery rice, you know, and it's, it's, uh, the rice is a little bit more sticky, so kind of slightly sort of, uh, it's a little bit like, say, oatmeal that was pretty runny, if you see what I mean. You know, not, not firm oatmeal, but soft and sloppy oatmeal, something like that. You know, this rice gruel is like that common dish. Have you eaten it yet? Yes, I have. Then wash your bowls. End of koan. Now, whoa, what on earth are we supposed to do this with this? I mean, first of all, surely you know, instruction in a Zen monastery, which is Zen actually is the, it's the, it's a transliteration of the word dhyana or jhana. Dhyana in Sanskrit, jhana in Pali. Uh, many of you will know that uh, jhana means 
Well, it can mean two things. It can mean certain deep states of meditative absorption. Or it can actually more generically mean meditation. But either way, this, and by the, when that word dhyana went to China, it became channa, and that became channa just got shortened to chan, and chan became zen in Japan. So zen meditation basically means, sorry, zen Buddhism basically means meditation Buddhism. It's all about meditating. So this, this, this poor guy's come to start doing that and he wants probably like guidance in how to meditate. You know, what should my first practice be, master? <laughs> Answer, have you finished lunch? <laughs> Basically, have you finished lunch? Well, yes. Or breakfast, have you finished breakfast? Yes. So wash your bowls. Now, how do we, yeah, how do we, how do we, how do we approach this even? Well, what we do in, in Zen is if we are interested in sitting with a koan, we're doing our regular sitting. You know, we're, we're, we're perhaps following the breath, perhaps sitting in open awareness. Actually, you know, a number of practices are compatible with adding a koan to them. Some are not, but you know, open awareness practice actually could be. Following breath could be. What would we do? Well, we're sitting, let's say with breath. We might simply throw in, wash your bowls. Three syllables, wash your bowls. Might just try that or we could run the little dialogue just in the back of our minds or in the front of our minds. Have you eaten your oatmeal? Yes, I have. Then wash your bowls. Okay. I'm going to suggest that we can, we can sort of put, a, put different lenses on this. And so here's a few. Yeah, there could be some sort of a practical advice here. Um, if you've finished your meal, do the washing up. And perhaps that is actually a larger piece of guidance than might first appear. Just do the washing up. What kind of adjustment in state of mind would it take for that to be enough? Sort of master kind of teach me the meaning of life sort of thing. Okay, have you finished lunch? Yes. Then wash your plate. Could it be somehow that we are not, I am not fully giving myself to this moment? Could it be that if I were to, if I were to open up to the needs, the... It's 1915. Okay. Um, if I were to open up to the needs of this moment wholeheartedly, that that would somehow make the experience of now qualitatively different from when I have other programs quietly running in the background about plans, things I got to do, the things I did before, you know, what about if I open so that there's nothing but now? Excuse me, just a moment. I think somebody is unmuted. Can I do anything about that? No. Okay. Okay. Um, so 
That's one possible approach. What would it be if I wholeheartedly, meaning nothing of me was sort of left out, if I fully did the next thing that needs to be done, the thing right now that needs to be done, and that's all I'm doing. Okay, one possible pointer. Second possible pointer. Um, actually, when washing, when washing, washing the bowl, what, what is this? Now, the reason, <laughs> the reason this might be worth asking what is washing a bowl is like on a course on one level well, of course we know we know exactly what it is it's just the ordinary experience of washing a piece of crockery a, a, what, what do we call it uh you know in we say crockery i think that's a uk term actually do you, i don't know if you guys use that Crockery and cutlery, you know, silverware and tableware or something, you know. I hope that's okay language. It's just the experience of washing the plate. But actually, actually, really, is it possible that there's a way in which all the things we do, um, the tasks we are engaged in, yes, we give our attention to them and we're doing them and they're sort of what they seem to be, but yet maybe there's somehow a, a bigger, wider context present. Almost as if sort of what we do, it can be seen in our normal way, experienced in our normal way, 100%, but maybe there's a wider context that we don't normally experience maybe i mean somebody actually just the other day was telling me they were they were thinking about something and suddenly realized they were kind of fretting about something and suddenly realized that their fretting the sort of mental activity in their minds you know that was like reflections on a great ocean it's like there's the activities that they were engaged in were part of a much bigger context. And they got a sense, not as an idea, but as an experience of this bigger context. They felt it. And it was a shock, you know, and they'd been sitting with a co-ed. And uh, I sort of humbly invited them to ponder that maybe the co-ed had something to do with that because all of them are also while they may point us to just occupying this moment more fully, they're more than that. They're actually sharing a perspective, a, 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 a breadth of experience that isn't, um, that's much wider. Um, now, another possible take is actually... Joshua's not even, suppose he's not even sort of giving future guidance, not even giving guidance as to the future. If you, bear with me, I hope I'll make this clear. So when he says, have you eaten your rice gruel? Maybe this is too weird, but let's see. Can you, maybe this, there's something here. Even when he's saying those words, for him, this other dimension I was mentioning earlier, absence, shunya, shunyata, emptiness, it's present right here, even as the words are spoken. In fact, it is showing itself as the words. 
have you eaten yet? There's the vast boundlessness that when we taste, when we experience it, it puts our ordinary life, doesn't negate it, it puts it in such a different context, such a different perspective, that our hearts break open and we fall in love with whatever life brings, even the difficult things change, and, and uh, we become so tender and we can't help but love this life and want to help it the best we can, meaning help all beings or whatever beings we meet and come into contact with to the best of our ability um, in whatever way is most appropriate. And so this boundless reality for Joshu is fully present because he knows everything arises from it. And basically that's the Zen teaching. And not to get that as an idea, but to get it as an experience. So the, the monk has asked, please give me guidance. And here it is. Have you eaten yet? He's already, for him, showing what Zen can open us up to. What practice can open us, open us up. Two. The monk apparently sort of doesn't see that naturally enough, not many of us would, and says, uh, yeah, I have, <laughs> taking it on the level in which it seems to be presented and it's fine to do that. And Joshu then says, so wash your bowls. Actually, once again, with these very words, then wash your bowls. So wash your bowls. Here it is again. It's always here always here the 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 destination the goal the you know longed for fulfillment that practice promises is always right here it's right here it's not actually in some fantastical remote different kind of experience it's right here in ordinary most ordinary things. See, Joshua doesn't say, you know, can I have guidance? Just says, well, realize, you know, who you really are and find that you're a boundless whatever. No. Just sink into your ordinary life. Release your sense of knowing what it is. Fall into the mystery let yourself fall into the mystery of this moment now, not some future one, not some different life, this life as it is. And by the way, one common feature of many of these Zen, enlightened, whatever, masters or you know, awakened practitioners commonly had tragic losses early in life. Very commonly, one or both parents died. Um, sometimes they, they were witnesses to their deaths. You know, they had traumatic events. And, um, and through practice, found a way to turn their difficulties and hardships and losses, I mean, this is not in every case, but in many, actually, to turn those to, into a, a great beauty, a very beautiful, compassionate, caring lives, fully immersed, fully yeah, occupying this life, the only way and place we can 
right here, right now. And maybe this is, yes it is indeed, one of the purposes of these koans. We sort of see it in action here with Joshu. So, okay, so that's basically the end of my talk. And actually, I'm sorry, it's a little longer than I'd planned. Um, So, end of talk. Gratitude to you all for listening. I'd like to see if anybody's got any questions. Um, So I'm going to open up chat and tick, 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 tick. Sorry, what am I doing? Yes, see what I can find. Okay. Um, uh, Okay, let me just, okay, see what I can do. Um, (laughs) Thank you. The best meaning of the word occupy. I like that. The entire teaching is available to us in every moment. Exactly. If we're able to learn it, enjoy, save it, lighten it, love it. We fall in love with our present moment again and again. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, Oh, yeah, Alan Watts. I love him too. Um, Now, should we... Well, we've got sort of three be with the bowl. Lovely. Um, observe the Dharma of life. Exactly. Conscious of being here. Watch your bowls. Being in the moment. Yes. Ramdas, be here now. Exactly. Um, wash your bowls. Chop wood, carry water. Exactly. Yes, the appropriate response to some kinds is a belly laugh. <laughs> Indeed. Um, oh, somebody's saying something nice about my book. Thank you very much. One blade of grass. Um, oh, the Tao of Poo. Yes. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Um, if you meet the Buddha on the road, kill him. That's nice. Thank you so much. What's this? Yogi Berra. When you come to a fork in the road, take it. <laughs> exactly. Um, okay, now, folks, does anybody want to ask a question? Oh, here's one. Does it make a difference if I repeat what is this in English and then que es esto? Spanish. I think it's follow your instinct. My mind seemed to do this. I'm deep in my Spanish all the day, except when I come to these meetings. So then pull back. The pull back to Spanish is strong. Totally. Go with the Spanish. I have done this meditation before with the bachelor during retreat. Lovely. Yes, please. By all means. ¿Qué es esto? ¿Qué es esto? Yes, yes, indeed. Are there any analogies to the book, The Cloud of the Unknown? Yes, and what a great question. You know, I actually, I have a, I have the book, The Cloud of Unknown, and I'm really, uh, I've, I've read parts of it, but I actually have not read the whole thing. But look at the title, The Cloud of Unknowing. Exactly. The release of knowing. The falling into mystery, the immersion in not knowing. Absolutely. Deep analogies out of the Christian tradition. How beautiful. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm scanning for other questions before we end. Um, millions of other people are also washing dishes just like me. Oh, how beautiful. Thank you. Exactly. This human life. This human life. Yes. The bowl is a Dharma door to liberation. Exactly. Exactly. I think Joshua would be very happy to hear that. I'm the unknowing monk. Congratulations. Excellent. That's what we all want to be. Um, um, oh, okay, this is very kind. Um, and very good comments here meaning of emptiness is form, form is emptiness. It means like this, you know, (laughs) that actually, okay, call it this absence is showing up exactly like this. This is it right here. Likewise, this right here is absence. So every phenomenon is sort of a doorway to boundlessness, boundlessness, every phenomenon is a doorway to it. But when we realize we're part of it, find it, what does it look like? It looks like this. It looks like this. It looks just like this. 
Okay, that's kind of kind of a sort of a way to put it. Ah, yeah, there are guided meditations on the website. Um, somebody's asking. Okay, so it is actually it's time. It's eight thirty here. It's seven thirty with you guys. I'm so honored to have, you know, um, been able to offer this guidance today, this evening, uh, for the third time. Actually, I've been with with you all. Uh, deep thanks to Rick for um, for allowing me to do this, and deep, deep thanks to you all for bearing with me and uh, and uh, letting me uh, sort of uh, offer what I can. And also great thanks to the team, Tom and um, Tom and George and Art. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I want to just bow to everybody and uh, express deep gratitude. Ah, we're so lucky to be able to practice. And best of all is practicing together. <laughs>